we just start with the importance making one or two on this process? Yeah, so let me start with number four. I'll try, try number four um, on worksheet two. Yeah, okay. So uh, first thing is we want to go through our conditions, right? So before we do any of that, we look at our equation. There's no variable denominator in the denominator. There's no vertical asymptote, um, and we can just uh, go ahead and write out our condition because I'm looking for those conditions in your justification. Right? So you could say uh, our function is continuous. On the closed interval. And differentiable. On the open interval from one to two. We're dealing with a polynomial. There's no issues there, right? Okay. So um, again, the formula for MVT is you want to set your instantaneous rate of change, which is your derivative, equal to your average rate of change which is your slope. But the trouble that students run into is they find the derivative too soon and then they start doing things with a derivative that shouldn't be done. So focus your attention on the average rate of change first. Find the slope between the endpoints first. So what can we do to do that? One in for x, that's not something to x. Mm-hmm. Just the, uh, That's right. It's the original equation, right? And so we'll find g of one. We'll find g of two. Okay. So one q minus one, zero. Two q minus two, six. Okay. What's next? Mm-hmm. Minus zero over this one. Yeah. Six. Good. So we'll set that number off to the side. We know we have to come back to it. Now we can focus on this side here, instantaneous rate of change. Derivative, yeah. This one is easy, power rule. Um, well, what does the formula tell us to do? Six. That's right. We said it equal to zero. If you said equal to zero, then you're then you're finding a critical point, which could be the case if the average rate of change is zero. But here, the average rate of change is six. So we're not looking for slope zero. We're looking for slope six. So we'll set these equal to each other. Oh. That's the correct answer, but there's something algebraically that I want to point out. Squared. Hmm? Squared. Squared. Yeah, so what do we do from here? Plus or minus three, seven, three. Yeah, plus or minus. Now these are two different locations. Do we keep both of the solutions? 
pay yes, but also no. Okay. This is um this is a location. Same idea with rules theorem with with EBT with IBT. What do you know about the location of our solution? Yeah, it has to be inside the interval. Okay. So that means we have to remove which one? Yeah, the negative was outside. If you're unsure, you can plug this in the calculator, but this is going to give you a decimal value that's between one and two. So. <clears throat> So we label our solution, our X value solution as C. No, we don't have to say that. We just say C equals root 7 over 3. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for the conditions. I'm looking for you to set up your steps, and that's all I need to do. You have to write any justification after that. No because statement. Okay. You want to just go down this page, or you have specific ones you want to do? OK, yeah, Rolle's theorem, same idea, continuous differentiable. You're still going to plug in your endpoints. The only difference is that we're looking for these to be the same Y value. That's it. And then you're still going to find the average rate of change. You're still going to find your instantaneous rate of change. It's just that with Rolle's theorem, we're looking for the two Y values to be the same. And that's, that, that's the only difference. So everything is virtually the same. It's just more restrictive it needs the same y value to force a slope of zero it doesn't have it. i'm sorry yeah. yeah that's right if it if the uh if they were asking for this problem to be rules theorem it would fail because this is not a slope of zero so then yeah this would both these will both have to be six or they both have to be zero or the same y value so this one would not work for rules theorem but this one works for mean value theorem. But if they were the same, it would still work for mean value theorem. Mean value theorem has, has, has a wider, uh, has a bigger umbrella. Um, it can take on Rolle's theorem, but Rolle's theorem is very specific. Okay, so try number three. See if all the steps, see if you can basically go through mean value theorem steps for number three. Yeah, but make sure you step through and write your conditions, right? Because if you don't, you're losing a point there.
Okay, plug in six. 36 minus 48 plus five. So, the rest of mean value theorem. Yeah, basically, yep. Yeah. Everything is virtually identical with mean value theorem. Yeah, so basically, Rolle's theorem does feel like you're just finding critical point, right? Because you're just setting f prime to zero. But we do need to go through this check here, make sure that the critical point that we're looking for needs to live between the endpoints. So that's why we're going through this additional check that we normally would just not worry about, right? It's like, so Rolls theorem is saying, find a critical point, but it has to live inside this interval. Can you guarantee a critical point inside that interval? And if we can get this to happen, then we can guarantee a critical point on that interval. But more specific, it needs to be slope zero, it can't be slope undefined, so. And we do need to make sure that the critical, that uh, the slope zero that we find, the location needs to live between the endpoints, and it does, right? Four lands somewhere between two and six. Okay, you know, just go ahead and try one and two critical points and extreme value theorem. You did those already? Okay, and you checked your answer and you were good. Number two, you did as well? Yeah. So just be careful with number two is extreme value theorem. It only has one condition, just continuity. So if you write differentiable for extreme value theorem, a point is taken off. So continuity is for extreme value theorem and only continuity, but then Rolle's theorem and mean value theorem has two conditions, continuity and differentiability. And um, you find your critical points, make sure that you only use critical points that are valid. Valid means between the endpoints. So zero, we keep negative four is out, so we only have three points to test. Negative three is zero and one, and don't give me order pair. You can write it as just the y value. You can write it as the y value and um, at x equals negative three, but the emphasis is at the y value. Order pair, you'll lose a point. If you leave the x value out, that's fine. But if you want to include the x value, then you need to write it this way.
Uh, first derivative test for number five, test for concavity, number six, and then sketching a graph, number seven. Okay, which one do you want to do? Cavity. Okay, so test for concavity. Uh, so we have to make our way down to the second derivative function, and then we'll create our slope sine line for f double prime, and then we'll populate that sine line. Okay. Uh, my first test point is negative one here, so I get positive times a negative, which is negative. So second derivative is not a down arrow, right? It's a upside down parabola. Yes, plug in. We can plug into either one, but it needs to be the second derivative. But I like the factored form because we can get the sign a lot faster that way. Less calculations. Okay, plug in one, positive times negative is negative. Plug in four, positive times positive is positive. So how many points of inflections do you see? There are two critical points, but what makes one a point of inflection and what one what makes one not a point of inflection hey, yeah that's fine yeah uh, okay yeah yeah scott is that you see anything with zero and three that makes one a point inflection and the other one doesn't? Oh no, I was asking. Yeah, I think I have five notes. Yes. But look at the sign line though. Do you see anything different about zero and three? The actual ton of points in there that just start. They're they're like separating the intervals. Okay. What else? You know, say anything about the signs that makes this different. So, what are the signs on either side of zero? Same or different? 
same. How about on either side of three? Yeah. So what do you think? Oh, to the negative, but the zero, and the zero, three, to the negative. Well, yeah, for, for concave up and concave down, you can definitely separate them. This, these are concave down. This is concave up. But point of inflection is where the sign changes. So <clears throat> this is not a point of inflection because there's no change in sign. In order for it to be a point of inflection, there has to be a, a change in cavity from concave up to concave up, concave down to concave up. Or we can't get over the top get down. So this is a critical point. These are both critical points, but this is the point of inflection because there's a shape. Okay. Any question about which graph? Like I think graph like numbers. Okay, so let's do the one on page 10. Okay, so it says sketch a label graph with the following characteristics. I have a bunch of order pairs that I can just go ahead and place onto my graph. Okay. So uh, we have a bunch of statements that we can use to help us fill out our F prime sign line. And we also have some statements about the second derivative, which, which we can fill out the second derivative sign line. And if we can fill out those sign lines, it helps us visualize how the graph is going to look before we actually just jump into it. So I think it's a nice um, bridge before we get into sketching the graph. So what does the first statement say? F prime of X is less than zero for X is less than one and for X greater than two. Can you phrase that a different way? Yeah, another way to say less than one is to the left of negative one. Okay, and then where else? So you know that those are your critical points, right? Because you know that those are boundaries. So you can go ahead and place negative one and two onto your F prime sine line. And we can say negative slope to the left of negative one and to the right of two. Okay, does that make sense? Converting yeah. that statement into something that's visual. Okay, so <clears throat> next statement, F prime of negative one is zero, F prime of two is zero. So we already, estimated that was going to be possibly true. But now we know that this is not going to be a sharp turn. It's going to be a nice, smooth um, slope zero. Okay. So it's going to be a smooth curve all the way through. Next statement, F prime of X is greater than zero for X between negative one and two. Okay. Let's move on to the second derivative sign line. F double prime is less than zero for X is less than negative four, X is greater than zero. What does that mean? Increasing. Now this is second derivative here, so. Can you phrase it a different way? So we have a word for this. Second derivative 
tells us information about what? Not increase, decrease, but. Yeah, concave up, concave down, right? So what does this mean here? F dual prime of X is less than zero. Mm hmm. Okay, f double prime of x is greater than zero for negative x is less than zero. Negative four is less than x less than zero. Oh, this one's concave down, right? Okay. Right. What about the last statement? Yeah, so right here, right between negative four and zero. OK, so I like to break this into two stages. It feels like a lot to do both at the same time. So let's sketch a graph where we can kind of lay down the foundation of our graph, kind of the path of the graph. And this kind of gives us more detail along the path of the graph. So we know there's a, a relative min at negative one. The graph's going to decrease, increase, and decrease. So I don't care about the curvature right now. I just want to make sure I can map out the path of my graph. Okay. So my graph is not going to. It, the curvature is going to be a little bit different than this, but it's going to have to follow this path, right? It's going to have to go down, up, down. So now that we have the path laid out, we can go back and we can give it the curvature within each of those intervals here. So up to negative four, we want the graph to show concave down. So it needs to have that concave down shape. It may not show the full concave down, but it just has that curvature that represents part of concave down. From here, it's going to switch over to what? Between negative four and zero, it's going to up. So it's going to have that, that U shape. And then it's going to end with yep so it's going to have that upside down u from here to here notice all this while we're still keeping the path relatively similar right we're not veering off from it and that's our graph I use the first, uh, yeah, so this is the final product, but I don't want to do the sketch of the second until I get the path laid out. Because if you look at this concave down here, the temptation is some students want to want to do this, right? Because this shows a more concave down shape, but what's wrong with this graph? Why can we not have the graph do this? Well, what do you know about the slope up to negative one? Do we start off with increasing slope or do we start off with a decreasing slope? Decreasing. So this is breaking the rule of this, right? So it's so it's important that we kind of lay out our foundation first that we know is decreasing so we don't do too much with concave down, right? Our concave down is only going to show uh, this portion that's decreasing because anything more is going to turn into an increasing.
Um, <clears throat> sketch a labeled graph of the function with the following characteristics. And so we have a bunch of order pairs here. Yeah, those are easy, right? Okay, f prime of x is less than zero, or x is less than two, or x is greater than four. <clears throat> f prime of two does not exist. Or. Or. I mean, these are both valid options, but it's not saying f of two does not exist. It says f prime of two does not exist. So <clears throat> what's another way of saying f prime of two? Is the what at two? It's not the order pair at two, it's the what at two. What's the what's another word for derivative? Starts with an S. Slope. Right. You, I mean, because you said you said decreasing, right? Decreasing is, re is referring to slope. Slope does not exist. What does it look like if a slope doesn't exist? If the slope doesn't exist. It looks like this. Sharp turn, right? Because I can't draw a tangent to that sharp turn because it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, doesn't line up. There's no way for me to draw a slope. That would be right, but I just want to kind of make sure that you see all the options, right? I mean, you could you could do a whole a vertical step or a sharp turn. But let's say the beginning of the problem said that the function is continuous all the way through. So if the function is continuous, then this is going to force this point to, to be a, a sharp turn. It doesn't say that, so you have the option, but I want to make sure that you understand all the options in front of you. Okay, f prime of four is equal to zero. So this is going to be a nice smooth curve, right? A nice smooth point. This is not going to be a nice smooth graph. Okay, f prime of x. It's greater than zero for two is less than x is less than four. <clears throat> Positive slope. Second derivative sign line. Can you say that a different way? Slope is first derivative. What's second derivative? Yeah, look at the previous one that we did. What did we call it? Yeah. So this is what concave down. Yeah, I want you to use those words because I think having that those visual words help, right? If you say second derivative is negative, it, it feels more abstract. <clears throat> it's not wrong, it's just that this less is less helpful. 
So <clears throat> let's sketch the graph with this first, right? This is going to lay out the path, and this is going to clean up that path a little bit. But it's, but it's, but if you're sketching this graph first, then uh, you may get a, a wrong idea as to what the graph looks like. So this is a better uh, uh, fit for. This is a better place to start. So the graph is going to decrease until it hits a minimum at two. It's going to rise to a max at four, and it's going to decrease after that. So now that we have the path laid out, we know that this is the path of our graph. We just have to kind of clean that, clean this up in terms of the curvature. So. What do we want the graph? And at two, we know that two is not actually no two is not going to be a vertical asymptote because there is an order pair here, so that's going to force it into a sharp turn. Okay, so I'm showing that concave down shape, sharp turn, and then finish off the graph with more concave down. And notice that I'm not fully committing to the full concave down because I do need the graph to decrease. So having that decreasing line kind of make sure that we don't veer off course, right? That we're just maintaining that that portion of concave down that is only showing decreasing. Does that mean it's not continuous? Uh, what's an example? Uh, like this. 3x, and then it would like negative 2 to 2 is the interval, then would it not be continuous? That's right, it wouldn't be continuous. If there's a vertical asymptote, that x equals 0. But if it was from negative 2 into negative 1, yeah. then we're safe. Okay, is that the only case where it wouldn't be? Right. If it's continuous, it is differentiable to the uh, Yes, for Rolle's theorem and mean valid theorem, but okay. don't write differentiable for EBT. Then you'll lose a point because extreme okay. valid theorem does not require differentiability. Only Rolle's the mean valid theorem. So, um, it's it, it's virtually identical steps. It's just that. Let me show you a mean value theorem that I just did. So Rolle's theorem and mean value theorem, we're both going to plug in order pairs, endpoints into or into the y value and getting and find a slope. Mean value theorem, these y values can be different. And that's fine because you may get a different slope. But Rolle's theorem just requires these y values to be what? That's it. That's the only thing. If it's not the same for Rolle's theorem, you would stop. But if they were not the same for mean value theorem, that's fine. You keep going. Yeah, that's the only difference. Other than that, exact same steps. All right. You're only working in searching. <laughs> 